Hi, I'm Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Real News Network and host of the podcast, Working People. And this is the art of class war on breaking points. Now, obviously, there's a lot going on in the country right now, and there are a lot of stories to unpack from this week's midterm elections. And thankfully, you're getting all the coverage and analysis you need right here on Breaking Points. But it will come as no surprise that on the art of class war, we're here to remind y'all that there are other important stories beyond this week's elections that need our attention too. And today, we're actually giving y'all a crucial update on a story that we've talked about previously on this channel. Back in the summer for my podcast, Working People, I got to speak with Brandy McNeese, a worker organizer at a Chipotle location in Augusta, Maine, and a founding member of Chipotle United. On June 22nd of this year, Brandy and her coworkers made history by becoming the first Chipotle store in the United States to file for a union election with the National Labor Relations Board. Among the many reasons workers at the Augusta location took that courageous step to band together, exercise their right to organize, and fight to improve their workplace, Brandy and I spoke at length about chronic understaffing at the store and the failure to bring in and retain staff, broken equipment, inadequate training, and unsafe working conditions, and overall a callous indifference from management when workers raise concerns about these very issues. Then, on Tuesday, July 19th, just hours before Brandy and her coworkers were scheduled to meet with Chipotle representatives to participate in a hearing before the National Labor Relations Board to discuss the impending union election, the company notified employees that it would be permanently closing the Augusta store. As union-busting companies literally always do, spokespeople for the fast casual dining giant denied that the store closure had anything at all to do with retaliation for union organizing activity, and that the decision was solely based on the company's inability to, quote, adequately staff this remote restaurant, end quote. Now, since that fateful day in July, it has been unclear what, if anything, would be done about Chipotle's egregious actions and what would happen to the workers in Augusta. Meanwhile, workers at a Chipotle location in Lansing, Michigan, became the first of the chain's 3,000 locations to unionize at the end of August, winning their union election outright and affiliating with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Then, last Thursday, we got some bombshell news out of the NLRB. As Josh Idelson reported at Bloomberg, quote, Chipotle Mexican Grill, Inc. illegally shut down a main restaurant because workers there tried to unionize, according to U.S. labor officials who are seeking to force the company to reopen the location and collectively bargain with the workers. A complaint filed Thursday by a regional director of the National Labor Relations Board on behalf of the agency's general counsel also seeks to make the company reinstate and compensate employees who lost their jobs when the store was shuttered, agency spokesperson Kayla Blado said in an email. In an emailed statement Thursday, Chipotle said it will, quote, vigorously defend its actions. Quote, our operational management reviewed this situation as it would any other restaurant with these unique staffing challenges, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer Lori Shallow said in an email. Quote, we respect our employees' right to organize under the National Labor Relations Act and are committed to ensuring a fair, just, and humane work environment that provides opportunities to all, end quote. So what does this news mean? What happens now? What are workers in Augusta doing and how are they feeling after months of waiting for the NLRB to vindicate them by stating in this complaint what they said was clear to them from the beginning about Chipotle's union busting? To talk about all of this and more, I'm honored to be joined by Brandy McNeese herself, a worker organizer at the Augusta Chipotle location and a founding member of Chipotle United. Now, we were hoping to record with Brandy here at the Breaking Point studio, but unfortunately something did come up. So we're about to play for you an interview that I recorded with Brandy 
from the Real News Network studio in Baltimore. Take a listen. Well, Brandy McNeese, it is so great to see you again and so great to chat to you again. Um, and I'm excited uh, for the Breaking Points audience to get to know more about you and the struggle that you and your coworkers have been in. So thank you so much for joining us today on Breaking Points. Thank you for inviting me back. Uh, the podcast that we did before really spoke to a lot of people. So I was looking forward to being able to work with you again. But it's cool to do like a video thing this time, too. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're we're stepping up our game, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and and I guess for why don't we start there, right? So, you know, let's get breaking points viewers um a little more acquainted with you and refresh everyone's memory about the Union Drive itself before the store closure, right? In case folks haven't listened to that great podcast that we did together, um, or they maybe, you know, listen to it back in the summer and need a refresher. Can you tell people a little bit more about who you are um, and what you have seen and experienced at your time working at Chipotle and what led you and your coworkers to, you know, band together, take that um, brave step to say, you know what, like, we're not going to quit. We're going to stay here and fight to improve uh, our workplaces and our workplace and make everything better for all of us. Um, yeah, I I worked at Chipotle for three years um, from 2016 to 2019. I worked with my way up to management um, and I left for a couple of years. I went to a desk job, um, really just burnt out as a manager. It was pretty awful. Um, and then in January of this year, I had lost my office job because of COVID um, and had come back to Chipotle as a trainer. I wanted to not be the one to try to crunch numbers and make it look good, but to actually educate people and, and help them. And um, it just wasn't possible. The whole store had fallen apart. There was no um, no consistency, no training, all of our equipment had broken down. There were safety issues like food safety and running around and stuff, but also gas leaks and really serious issues that we had been asking for help with and, you know, talking to management and calling their 800 numbers and doing everything that we were supposed to do. And it was all just falling on deaf ears. Um, and so I think what really made us band together and decide that we wanted to change it is that every single one of us has had a handful of fast food jobs and we all knew what we were getting into if we decided to go do something else somewhere else. You know, we were going to leave our families and we were going to go get mistreated somewhere else because it's not just a Chipotle problem, it's an industry problem. Um, so we wanted to stay with our families and we didn't want any other sort of career. Um, and we really liked what Chipotle was about on paper. So we figured that we'd stay and see if we could get them to live up to all of their promises and make it a good place to work. Well, and like, I think that if I recall correctly, um, I mentioned uh, the... Chipotle Union Drive that you were part of there in Augusta on breaking points for a past segment, uh, both to talk about the store closure, but also for a segment that I did on chronic understaffing happening in just so many different industries and affecting people working at so many different jobs. Because we all hear, right, the no one wants to work, uh, you know, bull crap over and over again. <laughs> But here we are hearing like y'all in, in Augusta, Maine saying like we're begging for more workers, but and we're running ourselves ragged trying to like do the work of 10 people with five. Right. And you hear that. But then you also hear that dollar store workers are working with one or two people in the entire store. Yeah. Educators are chronically understaffed. Teachers are taking on, you know, uh, over 30 students nurses across the country and other medical care staff are talking about the e unmanageable nurse to patient ratios, preventing them from giving the kind of care that they've been trained to give to all of their patients. Right. I mean, like this feels like a really like chronic 
problem that was really affecting y'all on the day-to-day level, right? Sorry. Yes, that was my kitty. (laughs) Um, Yes, it was a, I think what we've discovered in all of our fighting through all of this and talking to the other Chipotles and um, even with, you know, the Starbucks and Dollar General, and we've kind of had contact with a lot of different campaigns. And it seems like the corporations have taken this short staffing thing and turned it into a money saving tactic. Like they are intentionally short staffing because they are going to get every little bit of work that they can out of the people who are there and customers keep showing up and blaming it on the workers. So as long as that works for the corporation, it's fine. And they don't have to worry about the effect that it's having on the people, the people who are working you know, actually next to the customers and next to the humans that need this kind of care. Um, My house is falling apart and I apologize. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's, um, you know, it's knowing that if somebody comes in and the place is a disaster, that they're going to blame the person at the register and then call customer service and they're going to send them like a coupon for a free burrito, which costs them nothing. And that customer is going to keep coming back and spending their money there. And if they can just keep doing that and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing, then that's what they'll do. But at the same time, they're hiring twice as many people as they need. They're scheduling them for 15 hours a week when these people need 40 hours a week because then they can call them in to cover for short staffing when people call out or when we get busy or, you know, you create this situation where people need to be working, but you'll only let them work when you want them to be working. So it's not schedules don't matter at that point. You know, nothing like that. It's a real it's, it's a, I want to say it's an American problem at this point. It's not a restaurant industry or anything. It is just the servant class being squeezed. And it's, Man, yeah, I think that's, that's like powerfully and uh, put and spot on. Cause again, that seemed like what other interpretation can you have when you see this happening um, so much in so many different industries? I mean, I forgot to even mention the railroads, which we've been talking about as well. Like, this is what railroad workers have been telling me all year is like the big brain genius innovation that all of these business owners and CEOs and investors and shareholders, like their one big idea is, hey, let's pile more work onto fewer workers and pocket you know, the, the, the difference, right. Yeah. That's, that's essentially it. And these, and we hail people like Warren Buffett, uh, who owns Berkshire Hathaway, which owns BNSF railway, one of the worst offenders, you know, of the labor practices on the freight railroad system. We herald them as geniuses for what, for just figuring out how to better exploit people and make your service worse and run your workers into the ground. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, the idea of CEOs that come out of merit is very, very funny to me. There's literally nothing that they could do aside from having less con- concern, less concern for other people. Like mm-hmm. that's their major achievement is they figured right. out how to trade empathy for money. Congratulations. Congrats. Yeah, I guess. Good <laughs> good, good for you guys. Um, <laughs> right. Well, and... and 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 yet at the same time when workers like yourself and your coworkers band together and and try to do something to improve your situation what do you get you get you know just vicious union busting um and and retaliation across the the board uh intimidation um so on and so forth and that's obviously what we're here to kind of talk about today, because when you and I spoke on the podcast months ago, right, it was still in that space where you're just like, okay, well, legally, Chipotle says this has nothing to do with union busting. Workers say, well, it it seems pretty obvious what they're doing here. And we got to wait months for, you know, the National Labor Relations Board to kind of come out and say like, oh yeah, this, this, you know, is pretty clearly union busting. So we're going to talk more about that 
um, you know, ruling from or the complaint from the NLRB in a second. But I was wondering if you could just talk to us a bit more about the day of the store closure, like how you remember things playing out and what it felt like for you guys, because, you know, I, I, I can only imagine just the after after, you know, all of the momentum, you're you're hours away from this hearing um, to talk about the upcoming election and then bam, the rug is pulled out from under you. So I guess, yeah. Can you talk us um, through what that was like um, and what has been happening in the weeks and months after that? Like, how are you guys holding up? Um, yeah, I, it was, it was nuts. When we found out that they were closing the store, we had no, like nobody thought they were going to be that bold. Like you wouldn't really be that crazy. Right. Um, so we had been getting ready for the hearing and we were all, you know, excited and waiting. Maybe we're going to have to wait like an extra month for the election. When we filed on the 23rd of June, we asked for an election by like July 4th. So <laughs> we had really like hoped that we were going to get, I'm so sorry. Pause for a sec. Hold on. keeps getting out of the room. <laughs> um, this is so adorable. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. We call her angel. That's not, it's not right. Um, so the, yeah. So the day of the hearing, um, you know, we had been waiting already for a really long time. We had hoped that it was going to be, you know, we're going to file, they're going to disagree, but we're still going to get in there and get our date. And, you know, we were thinking like maybe the middle of August, if we really had to wait a long time, um, you know, and we had heard about other union busting stuff that had happened between the filing and the election. And we just didn't, we didn't think that them shutting us down like that was going to happen. So I was traveling to meet with the lawyer to sit in on the hearing. Um, we were meeting, it was all on zoom. So we were meeting in a uh, town, like less than an hour away. And I was on the drive and I started getting these messages in our group chat um, saying stuff like, you know, they're going to shut down the store and this, and we just got this email and, I hadn't checked my email. I was driving, but I'm responding to these messages because everybody seems really like, like they had given up. And I was like, no guys, like don't say stuff like that. You know, I thought they were reacting to the hearing. Oh, it's, it's too late. We're not going to make it. And I am trying to like hold them up. And it was like fistfuls of sand, you know, like, no guys, it's okay. It's okay. And it's running through my fingers as I'm realizing that like, they had all gotten that email and somebody had said, no, Brandy, we got an email and they're shutting us down. Um, and I think about it now and I get really emotional, but at that point I was just angry. I was so angry. Um, you know, we had stood up because they had mistreated us that we were tired of watching our family get kicked around. And then they just stepped on us. You know, they went from like abusing us to just total, like, how are we going to feed our families? Um, and how dare you, how dare you just pick up and walk away? Like we did everything right. There are rules because there's a process in place. People have talked about this. There's been decisions. Nobody is above the law. Like how could you? Um, so we spent that day figuring stuff out. Um, we ended up rallying outside of the store that night, actually a bunch of our supporters and the people that we'd been working with just kind of turned out at the store that night. And we did a demonstration and got a bunch of, um, media coverage and they came the next day to take the Chipotle sign off the storefront because they didn't want that in the media anymore. Um, and since then, it's been, you know, like people have had to take other jobs 
two other jobs, struggling to be, I don't know, to be still in the fight and also still living your life. Um, it's been hard for a lot of people. And the, the best thing that we've been able to do is just to keep in touch um, and, and let, let each other deal with our own issues. Like nobody's in it all of the time. And we are very giving each other grace is a thing that we have to practice a lot because we're all in it together, but it's really hard. It's so hard to be in it sometimes that, you know, you just do the best you can to stick together. Well, I'm like, you know, it's so infuriating. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll try to contain myself here. Not that anyone on this channel expects uh, more of me, right? I've, <laughs> I've been pretty clear about what makes me angry in situations like these. And, and it's just so, it's so frustrating and infuriating because that's, that's why they're doing it. That's the point. That is the net effect that they know they're going to get from breaking the law this way. Right. You know, Starbucks knows that it can fi it'll break the law as many times as it needs to. It'll fire as many organizers as it needs to. It'll close stores like the Ithaca College Avenue store in Ithaca, New York, which was closed around the same time um, that your store was closed after they had unionized. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But it's like everyone's watching like these crimes be committed in broad daylight that are that are very clearly, you know, uh, uh, forms of retaliation for workers engaging in concerted protected activities. Um, but because of the way the system is set up, we can't really say that we got to wait for months, if not years, for this to kind of snake its way through legal proceedings and back and forth uh, rulings and appeals um, to the point that all the while, while that's all happening, People are struggling to pay rent. They are drifting apart, you know, because they, they have to go find other jobs. They are demoralized from, you know, having the rug pulled out from under them. Under them. That is what all of this law-breaking, union-busting crap is meant to do. It is meant to demoralize people. And I'm, I'm talking to viewers and listeners here. We have to understand and listen to what Brandy's saying because this is the human toll of this crap. And this is why we have to keep holding these companies accountable and not forget about the workers who are being wronged here so blatantly because their rights are being violated. And if their rights are being violated, any of ours can be violated. But again, we had a bit of good news this month, right? We had a, a kind of you know, bombshell complaint filed by the National Labor Relations Board Regional Director on November 3rd. Um, talk to us about that, Brandy. Like, let, like talk viewers and listeners through uh, what that complaint from the NLRB said, what it means, and what it was like for you all um, to hear it. Um, yeah, I, the first, like, there were, what, three months, three and a half months of back and forth before we got to this complaint. Um, and I probably communicated with the labor board once a week or once every other week. So it's not like we got shut down and then everybody went on their ways and we got a phone call. It was like constant, you know, we need a statement from this person and can you get in touch with that person? And do you know who can speak on these issues? Um, so we've been grinding you know, for three and a half months. And in the last couple of weeks, they had started saying, you know, it looks like we're wrapping up. We should probably have something coming out soon. Um, and I had a good feeling, but it's so scary <laughs> to have a good feeling when you're dealing with criminals, uh, especially corporate criminals. So we kind of held it in. And then I got a call from the lawyer, from our lawyer. Um, and it just, he left me a voicemail. He said, I just got off the phone with Hillary. That's the the regional director, Hillary Bede. Um, and you've got to call me. And 
I called him and immediately like he picked up the phone and then he hit send on this message that he had typed up and sent to like lawyers and all these people that had helped us and all of the different Chipotles and all these, you know, like high ranking, I don't, I don't want to say corporate people, um, political, political people. You can tell I'm a little sleepy. (laughs) Um, so I, I like, I picked up the phone and he emailed 50 of the most important people that he knew to say we won. Um, and if, um, the labor board vindicated us, like, I didn't really understand the process. Um, and then he explained that like, okay, well now the labor board is, um, there is your lawyer. Now their lawyer is your lawyer. I'm not, I'm not there anymore. Like they're fighting for you now. And (laughs) that to me was probably the most incredible thing I've ever like, Oh, okay. Uh, so we really were wronged, you know, the things that we've been dealing with, um, are serious enough that we're pursuing this company, uh, the, the people in charge of deciding whether we were violate our rights were violated, you know, they're taking up on our behalf and suing this company. Like, okay, I, I feel, um, vindicated in my anger and also supported. Hold on. It's the last door I can close or behind, but there's a person in there. So <laughs> I love how just like a cat too, she's just like, I'm going to run over the keyboard. Cause <laughs> like I could run anywhere in this house. <laughs> just right over that. Yeah. Right in front. It's like a jumping in front of my face thing. Just mm. right um, um, so okay. So it up from... mean, start. Yeah. Pick up from uh, right before the cat jumped in. Um their lawyers uh, are taking it up. Um, we're vindicated. Uh, yeah, I could say. Yeah. I think I was saying the people who are in charge of deciding whether our rights got violated. Yeah. Are suing the company on our behalf because they not only violated our rights, but they broke the law in such a way that to allow it to stand would, would cause damage, would erode the law. Um, and that is a huge thing, actually, for them to say that they're going to seek an injunction that will compel Chipotle to bargain with us. Um, as a union without an election because they damaged our unit beyond like being served by a fair election it can't happen now so what that is telling the companies is that if you break the law bad enough we're just gonna set everything in the favor of the employees like you can't you can't break the law now and extend it forever and ever and ever through the power of attorneys and expect that it's going to fly. Now, if you break the law under the current labor board, they're going to give the employees everything that they wanted and needed to begin with because we can't let the corporations take any more power. Um, Yeah, it was vindication, but it was also a sense of we're going to take care of some people. This is going to help so many people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay, guys. I know what happened. I know what it looked like. I know it's been really hard. But if this is the labor board that we have right now, then, man, it's incredible. It's it's now. We got to go right now. Right now. We see what's happening right now. We've got the labor board we need. Let's go. 
Right. And I mean, um, you know, again, even with the the National Labor Relations Board being uh, understaffed, underfunded and and having to process so many different cases uh, on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Right. Hence why, you know, or hence, hence these, these cases take uh, so much time. But it is important for all of us, everyone watching and listening to this, right, to keep up with this, right, to keep uh, our attention focused on these stories, because, again, it, it, it shows what these companies are really up to. So Starbucks will keep telling every newspaper that asks, no, we're not retaliating against workers for organizing. And yet they were ordered by the National Labor Relations Board to reinstate the Memphis Seven, um, saying that they were uh, wrongfully terminated. Um, as I mentioned, the NLRB at uh, uh, the same time that they um, filed the complaint about Brandy's Chipotle location in Augusta, um, they also filed uh, a, a complaint saying that the Starbucks store closure in Ithaca uh, was was you know breaking the law and it was union busting, right? So like. What we're seeing through these rulings when uh, the National Labor Relations Board has a chance to review the facts uh, of these store closures, firings, reprimands, so on and so forth, is that these companies are breaking the law, that Starbucks is a criminal enterprise at this point, right? That Chipotle is following suit. Like, that is really the, the headline here. And so... I mean, I could talk to you for days, Brandy, but I know I got to kind of let you go and we got to wrap this up. So I wanted to sort of ask in that vein, if you just had like final thoughts that you wanted to communicate to people watching and listening, maybe people are thinking of organizing themselves, but are worried about facing something like this or, or people want to know how they can help and show solidarity with you and your fellow workers. Where do we go from here, I guess, is my final question for you. That's a really good question. Um, people have asked me that a lot, too. First of all, as far as showing solidarity, because this is something that um, I don't I've, I've never like asked or talked about a lot, um, which is kind of it's like a point of pride, I guess, that that's the first thing that we all need to do is get over ourselves because um, because we did really need some help. And there is a fund that we have going on um, that I'll give you the link to. I don't know it off the top of my head, but um, it, yeah, I'm open to accepting help for our family right now um, more than ever. And as far as helping you uh, and your own families and the people, you know, that you care about and employers and stuff like that, or employees, other employees, um, there, there may be some scary things that corporations can do to make you feel like your job's not safe or your livelihood isn't going to be protected or they can, you know, get away with some really nasty stuff. But it's right now, the labor board is sick of it. Um, I think is really what's happening right now. They, I mean, they're really swinging hard against a lot of this. They've been playing with Starbucks for a year in all of this stuff. They are tired of watching these corporations try it. I mean, at some point, you know, you've got to just sit them down. Um, and if the labor board is ready to do that, then we need to take that time to really um, to move as as quickly as we can and in um, in step with each other as well as we can. There are organizations like EWOP um, that's working with the AAA out in Michigan um, with the Teamsters and the Maine Labor Alliance, which I'm a part of, who are in between resources now. We realize that a lot of times people call and say, I want to unionize, and there's just nobody really there to help in their particular industry or to help connect them with another labor organization. Um, so you don't even have to call a, call a union 
or know a union or know who to call or who to affiliate with or like don't worry about any of that stuff. The paperwork is going to come and the figuring out all of the logistics is going to come like the first thing that you need to do is look at the person working next to you and be like, does this suck? is bad for you as it does for me? Like, am I the only one right now that is going home and crying in my car until I get to park? Like, you have to know that you're not alone. And then you have to start looking for ways to look out for each other. And once you figure out, you know, is there some huge egregious thing that's going on that we've all just been dealing with because we didn't think that we could do anything about it. If you raise three or four or seven or 14 voices at the same time, your employer's going to go, shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is really, it's a beautiful thing. I'm not going to... Um, but it all starts with having a relationship with the people around you and understanding what it is that's happening to all of you together so that you can fight together. Um, and you have so many rights is the other thing. I didn't know that we had a right to walk out because we were in an unsafe situation. We all thought that we were going to get fired, but we were like, I don't fire us all. I guess that's, we're not going to do this. Um, and you have a right to talk to your coworkers and you have a right to meet outside of work and discuss issues and please talk about how much they're paying you for the love of God. That is not illegal in any way, even if they tell you it's not okay. Don't let them tell you what to do. Get together with your peers, your coworkers, your family, figure out what the issues are and start speaking up call an in-between person, call the AFL, call any union you know of or somebody involved with the movement. Um, we are, we're all here to make this big, as big as possible. I don't care if somebody called me and said, hey, I heard the unions made weekends. Can we get more of that? Like, yes, yes, we can. Yes, let's talk. Let's do this right now. Like that is where we are. And there are so many of us ready to deploy to make this huge. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not even sure if I answered your question. I'm sorry. I just kind of went off, but No, um, no, that was <laughs> <laughs> uh, you answered it and then some. Um, I think that that is, you know, really important and something that yeah, everyone needs to hear because like you said, I think the vast majority of us have no idea what our rights actually are in the workplace. And on top of that, you know, living in this country, um, you know, it, you work under a, a boss, you live under a landlord, you are subjected to the whims of politicians, all of whom treat you as worthless. And if, if you don't talk to your coworkers, if you don't stand up together and fight back, you're going to, convince yourself that you are as worthless as the system tries to convince all of us that we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that you and your coworkers have you know, demonstrated uh, through such, you know, hard struggle and through so much injustice, you know, what it looks like to assert your worth, right. And, and to assert your value as human beings, as working people, as family, like, as you said, and friends who care about each other and don't want to see each other, uh, exploited in the way that you were, mistreated in the way that you were. And I think that is a message that everyone needs to hear. And Brandy, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and chatting with me here on Breaking Points. I know you've had a long day, long week, long month, long year. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to thank you. And for everyone watching, uh, that is the great Brandy McNeese, uh, worker organizer at the Augusta, Maine, Chipotle location, which uh, was, now we can say, illegally closed in retaliation for organizing activity happening there. And Brandy is also a founding member of Chipotle United. Brandy, thank you so much for joining us today on Breaking Points. Thank you, Max. It was good to visit with you again. We'll chat soon. Thank you for watching this segment with Breaking Points. And be sure to subscribe to my news outlet, The Real News, with links in the description. See you soon for the next edition of The Art of Class War. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Solidarity forever.
Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.